1973, according to court documents, Hoover allegedly orders the execution of William Pookie Young for robbing one of his narcotics houses. Hoover is arrested and charged with murder, and although he never pulled the trigger, Hoover is found guilty and sentenced to 150 to 200 years, 23 years old, in Statesville maximum security. prison, he is still viewed by police as the leader of the state's largest and most dangerous street gang. Joni Lum is here with the latest on today's raid. Joni? Sonia and Dave, authorities believe Larry Hoover is running an enormous gang operation from inside the Dixon Correctional Center where he is housed. Chicago, Illinois, and IRS agents carried out a federal warrant at the offices of Save the Children Promotions, looking for evidence of income tax evasion and money laundering. The 44-year-old acknowledged leader of the Black Gangster Disciples has been in prison since 1973 for a drug-related murder. At several parole hearings, he's claimed he's a changed man who is no longer violent. Today, police spent about two hours combing through the records of Save the Children on the South Side. They seized half a dozen cardboard boxes and file cabinets of financial records and also $7,000 in cash. Police say the charity organization has legitimate operations, but they also believe it is a front for an effort to get Hoover out of jail. Police believe that Hoover has been running drug trafficking in the city of Chicago from his jail cell, and that potential tax law violations may be a way to dismantle the gang. Police also went to the home of Hoover's wife, Wendy Jenkins, where they also just took some records. Yeah. And they haven't said yet exactly what they found in those records? or they, they found records with some amounts, but they did not find any drugs, and they haven't had any charges yet. It can have two effects. It can harden you, or it can make you think. And uh, I thought... What have you thought? What are the thoughts like? day-to-day -day basis incarceration. Well, basically, uh, you think about preparing yourself for the future and preparing yourself for one day when you will return to the street. Are you prepared? Yes, I'm prepared. I have, uh, I've got employment. Uh, I want to do something for the community. Uh, I see these kids coming in here every day with 10, 20, 30, 40 years, their life wasted just like I wasted mine. In 1969, we combined forces and we established two kings and two princes. Uh, I was very instrumental in the disciples and the gangsters coming together. When I went to jail in 19... 68 for failure to register a gun and unlawful use of a weapon. I met David Box there while I was in the House of Correction. We was at odds when we first met. After a while, he began to love me and I began to love him as my brother. When I came out of jail in uh, 69, Hoover was ambassador of the Stones. We had a nation meeting of the gangsters and I said I wasn't going to be no stone. That night, Hoover called Jeff Ford and told him that uh, he could no longer be a, be a stone or ambassador of the stone. Wait a minute. Hoover called, who called who now? Say that again. Hoover called Jeff Ford. Right. And told him that he could no longer be uh, affiliated with the stone. And, and, and I believe he did that out of his love for me. The next day, Jeff came to 68 degree and wanted to try to straighten it out. We wouldn't hear of it. So he left with a little anger. About six months, six months later, six or seven months later, with me talking to Larry and me also keeping in contact with David, I had a chance to bring them together. And we sat and we decided that we would, it would be an equal partnership. That's how it got to be two kings and two princes. Name the two kings and name the two princes. David Boxdale and Larry Hoover combined makes up the king 
of the Black Gangster Disciples, Tennessee, and a brother named Old Timer was their prince, their second in charge. And Larry Hoover, you know, had this vision for the Gangster Disciples, and they followed it. Hoover modeled the GDs like a big corporation. He appointed himself chairman and set up a board of directors inside the pen and another one on the streets. The fact that Hoover was serving life at a state prison in Dixon, Illinois, did little to thwart his ambitions. Larry Hoover was very, very sharp in terms of flying under the radar. He didn't walk around flying colors. He didn't walk around flashing signs. He was very uh, low-keyed in his presence. Hoover took advantage of the state prison's liberal rules to hold scores of meetings with gang members over the phone and in the visitation room. There were certain board members that could meet with him and he would give direction as to what he wanted done. The board members would, would listen to him and carry out his orders. These GD leaders passed orders down to foot soldiers who then carried out the gang's business on the streets. He had developed his organization to a point where he had several layers that made it very difficult to ever implicate him on anything. In 1978, Hoover solidified his power base behind bars. He convinced black, white, and Latino prison gangs to unite under one banner while serving time. The alliance gave them unprecedented control. Hoover called it the Folks Nation. Hoover got them together and made all of them drop the flags that they were with and become just one game. With his power inside cemented, Hoover flexed his muscle on the streets. He imposed attacks on all drug sales made on GD turf. In exchange for the right to sling dope, dealers had to share 70% of their earnings with the GD leadership. Hoover's enforcers made sure that everyone paid up. We had to pay dues, you know what I'm saying? Every week they said that this money was going to be used to buy guns, clothing, pay rents, lawyers, things of that nature. In the late 1980s, the explosive rise of crack cocaine transformed Hoover's organization into a drug empire. The GDs amassed yearly profits in the tens of millions of dollars but they always wanted more. Snatching up drug turf from rival gangs. That's why there was so much violence, because they tried to acquire as much territory as they could in order to sell the narcotics and generate more revenue. There aren't kids uh, anymore in, in the gangs. This isn't the West Side Story of the, of the 1950s uh, movie. These are businessmen. This is the new outfit. In the late 80s and uh, very early 90s, they became a, a national force by uh, recognizing outside markets outside of the city of Chicago and began putting their members in the various cities throughout the United States. The, the gangster disciples are now in a position to import uh, narcotics from foreign countries. They're controlling the distribution of narcotics in uh, Chicago. The GDs have other ways of identifying themselves, from brandishing black and blue colors to signing to the right. That means cocking their hats to the right, crossing their arms to the right, or rolling up their right pant legs. And they use hand signals and handshakes to tell friend from foe. When you approach someone with a handshake and he said that he was a part of your gang, as soon as you shake his hand, he know what fingers to throw up to you, which fingers to intertwine with other fingers. And if he didn't know that, then he could be jumped up immediately. Uh, one teenager don't like the other teenagers because the way he wears his hat. Because his ideology is different from his. Uh, a disciple don't like a vice lord. The GD school themselves in the gang's constitution and 16 codes of conduct, written by the chairman, Larry Hoover. 
These codes shape every aspect of how they live and work. First one was silence and secrecy. That's why you didn't talk to no non-members about organization business, period. The chairman came up with a little saying, which was, if the duck wouldn't have quacked, he wouldn't have wind up on the hunter's dinner table. It's your mouth that gets you in trouble. Other rules forbid GD members from using drugs, showing disrespect, and drawing the attention of the police. The GDs enforce a variety of punishments for those who break the rules, from fines to beatings to death. Larry Hoover, the membership in today's day and age, they don't even know who he is. They don't even know what he looks like. They dominated the drug trade in cities across the Midwest. It's like a cancer, it spreads. You got gangster disciples on every street corner. Not since the days of Capone has a Chicago gang ruled with such bloodlust. They will assault you, beat you, shoot you, threaten your family, threaten your children. It's the more fear, you know, the more respect. Oh, yes. <laughs> Torture, dismemberment, murder. It's strictly business for the GDs. It's like that. It's real out here, man. Their simple goal, more money and more power. Q says he worked as a shooter for the GDs when they battled their rivals for drug turf at the Cabrini Green housing projects. For every person you shot, you get points, you know, and points added up to respect in the neighborhood and um, ultimately leadership position, you know. Because every gang wanted to expand its territory, places like Cabrini Green turned into war zones, torn apart by sniper fire. Every day, it was a constant tug of war over area. And the only way that you can keep somebody at bay is to keep applying pressure every day. The early 1990s, the frequency and brutality of gangland crime stirred up federal law enforcement. Agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms joined forces with the Chicago Police Department to wage a massive sting operation against the GDs. It's time to take them off. It's time to stop the violence. Authorities took aim at the upper echelons of the gang, including Chairman Larry Hoover, in the hope of crippling the GDs' multi-million dollar drug empire. By wiretapping Hoover's frequent phone calls from state prison, the feds discovered that he was laundering drug money. So he got into, I don't know why and what reason to get into it, because he, he was a child has always understood. But he would go out there, if he pulled, took it away, and went to the NP at that time, we had A's and P's, and delivered people's groceries. Larry's gonna bring that money home and give it to me. He made sure that we didn't suffer even from a kid coming up. That's the type of person there was. Very family orientated and uh, he was a good brother. You uh -huh. know, we had three brothers. Well, I had, I did have three brothers. I only have one now, two is deceased. But Larry was always understanding. He was the oldest. <clears throat> he was the oldest. You know, during holidays, he was always there. You know, Christmas time, by my mom being the mom and dad in certain situations, mm -hmm. uh, he would always say, Mom, don't worry about me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Make sure Diane and Ronnie and Charles Ray was taken care of. When I think of Larry Hoover, I think of two years ago scenarios. Uh, one is this um, monster that the government wanted to create. If this was a desire to leave, that this was this horrible person who ran a gang from a prison for over 20 years. And then I think about the Larry Hoover, the individual that I know, uh, who is a very bright, very articulate, um, a young man who has the ability to influence people 
to encourage people to do the right thing. A person who is just a very dynamic individual. All I can say is that, uh, Uh, I can't take back what I've done. You know. After uh, I've been convicted of, it. all I can, all I can do is try to do something to make sure that this doesn't happen again. While incarcerated, he starts to establish guidelines for his followers, and like any good thinker, he puts it down on paper, and the paper is known as the blueprint. This blueprint is a bound copy of a jailhouse manual. ATF recovered this manual as a jailhouse, uh, a, almost a Bible for the street gang. Growth and development, it's GD, it's, it's the same thing. This is just a bound version to cover up what these guys are putting together in jail. Well, I've been working over the past two years to try to redirect the energies of my immediate organization. I was one of the principal components in forging the United Peace Organization, designed to stop kids from killing each other. I know what they're doing. I see the mistakes. I've made the mistakes. Organized crime, and that's what they want to do. They want to create a front, and they want to slow down uh, the actual violence, so we'll get off their back. They're not fooling us at all. It's a, uh, it's a reshaping. Uh, when you when you take away a man's freedom, then he, he looks at life in a whole different manner. He uh, he knows the importance of his own mortality and the importance of human life itself. Uh, his values change. Larry Hoover devised while he was in prison a structure that would m mirror a corporate structure. He placed himself at the top as chairman of the board of directors. Immediately beneath him was the board of directors. Approximately half of those members were incarcerated and they controlled the prison system. Half of them were unincarcerated. They controlled the gangster disciples operations on the street. Every man can change. Every day you change. Uh, you can't never persuade a person. Uh, your actions got to tell, got to show whether you changed or not. The only way I can answer that, my actions don't show that I've changed. My actions up to this point show that I'm, I'm trying to make a change, I'm trying to be accepted in this world. The truth is, niggas in the street got to get together all over the nation. I'm not the uh, regular people in the street. I'm talking about street niggas. I'm talking about niggas that call themselves gangsters. Real gangsters go to the polls.